tuned for The Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Our guests waiting to be profiled are author Jackie Collins and musician Avakian. Jackie Collins was born and raised in London. Her father was a theatrical booking agent who wanted both daughters to be actors. Joan Collins, her sister, came to Hollywood to establish herself as a star, and soon after, Jackie, the younger sister, arrived in Los Angeles. She looked for some place to act, but instead became a best-selling author and a Hollywood wife to producer Oscar Lerman. We're going to see the interview with Jackie Collins. Hi, Jackie. Hi, Joan. Good to see you. Great to see you, too. We go way back. I think we yes. became friends the minute you stepped foot on this soil. I think you're absolutely right. <laughs> you were one of the first people I met, and, and you've always been great to me, and I appreciate that. You were always writing, I guess. Were you writing novels in London before you came here? I was. I wrote uh, The Stud, The World is Full of Married Men, The World is Full of Divorced Women, and then I decided I wanted to write the definitive American gangster. I called Chances my early Harold Robbins, and that's when I decided to move to America. Oh, is that what brought you here? Yeah, Chances. Oh, I didn't know well, that. Chances, yes. But there you were in London with all these titles under your belt already. Yes. Did you always want to write? I always did. Ever since I was a little kid, I was making up these dirty limericks and selling them <laughs> to my friends and going, you know, Twas on the Good Ship Venus. But that was a famous one. I would take famous ones and maybe tweak it a little bit. And, and, and um, were you being published by your high school papers? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I, I, I was self-published, yes. Yeah. Self-published, <laughs> yes, and, and thrown out of school for it. <laughs> but uh, it was always fun. It was always my passion. You uh, and I both raised our daughters at the same time, mm. but you were always birthing your books. It was 20, maybe 30 years. Yes. How did you juggle that family life? It's very interesting, you know, to be able to do that. I think you have two separate personalities. My children, when they <laughs> saw me on television, would say, oh, there's Jackie Collins. And Jackie Collins was someone different to their mother. And once I remember my little daughter, Rory, looking at me on television, bursting into tears and going, but that's, you're my mom, that's not you. And I went, well, yeah. But I always, you know, I was surrounded by people with great luxury and who would have servants and people to look after their children. I always took them to school. I always gave them their dinner. I always gave them their bath every night. I never left them for anything. In fact, I would travel with them. So I would go to Chicago or something to do Oprah. And uh, I would arrive with, you know, three children and my husband. Well, that's why I wanted to ask, because I know you were always in the house with your husband, and no one could believe you were having this family life. Exactly. And yet on the outside, you were doing these naughty, naughty things. <laughs> well, I mean, you were writing these naughty things. I was writing naughty these naughty things. <laughs> well, you know, I, as a storyteller, I think true storytellers, and I think that's why I have been lucky enough to still be writing and still be on the bestseller list, because I'm a storyteller. That's what I do. I make up these incredible characters, and I tell stories. And in Lovers and Players, I wanted to write about family, but it's a, an abusive family. And I thought it was interesting to create three brothers with a very abusive father, Red Diamond, the dysfunctional billionaire. And you were always in the world of the Hollywood genre. This is a new world the business world, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, Lovers and Players takes place over seven days in New York. And over those seven days, you will see two murders, you will see Russian hookers, <laughs> you will see call girls, you will see mobsters, you will see family uh, kind of... Uh, Massacre, well, you know, interactions, interactions, right. family interactions. You will see a great love story with Amy, the beautiful New York princess. And then, of course, there's Liberty, my biracial 19-year-old waitress. Well, I think what you've said just shows that you're 
always in the time. You're always yeah. in the moment. Because bringing this Russian socialite in is so today, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> well, I, I, I'm a pop culture junkie. I just right. love pop culture. And uh, with Liberty, I wanted to introduce a hip hop mogul because, you know, I know a few of them and I thought they're interesting characters. Like you look at Diddy and you look at Jay Z and you look at uh, people like Russell Simmons, and to me, they're so fascinating and interesting. So I created Damon P. Donnell, who she falls in P. love with and he falls in <laughs> love with her. But he's married, and she won't sleep with a married man, Liberty. And she's connected to the Diamond family because her mother works as their housekeeper. But did you know these uh, hip-hop kids and uh, some of the business people that you're talking about? How do you research that? Well, I knew them. I mean, I, I, <laughs> y you know, we go to the same parties. Right. I know these people intimately. <clears throat> and, and Red Diamond is based very much on several moguls that I've observed over the years, who shall be nameless. The other thing, <laughs> you talking about all the parties we go to and yes. all the friends we have, do you still have the same friends after writing 23 New York Times bestsellers to your credit? You know, I do. I do. Uh, some of my closest friends um, I've been friends with for many years, such as Sydney and Joanna Poitier. In fact, little Sydney, Sydney Poitier's daughter, reads one of the roles on the audio. It was so much fun. Oh. I read the audio. I read the uh, Russian call girls. I was very good as a Russian call girl. See, I told you. <laughs> see how trendy you were? <laughs> and, and Sydney read Liberty and some of the other characters, the hip-hop characters. And then Jack Scalia, an actor friend of mine, read the male characters. So it was so much fun. So instead of just being an audio with me reading it, which is what I usually do, it's an audio with everybody on it. Oh, that's the audio book that Yeah, the comes audio out. book. Do all of your books have audios? They do. <clears throat> oh, my and God. And we have, uh, we have, well, usually I do them myself, but this time it's going to be And you produce that? I don't produce it, oh. no, but I appear in it. But going back to when you first started in movies, you had The World is Full of Married Men, The Stud, The Bitch. Those were all made into movies, weren't they? They were all made into movies, yeah. In fact, the late Tony Franciosa, who just died this week, who was a wonderful actor, was in The World is Full of Married Men with Carol Baker. And did you do that here? Uh, no, we did that in England. Oh, we made that did. in England. <clears throat> and um, then we did uh, The Stud in England and The Bitch in England. And then I wrote an original movie called Yesterday's Hero, which starred Ian McShane, who's found great fame on Deadwood. Oh, and people my. have fun going to my website, because if they look up my movies and they go to Yesterday's Hero, they will find all these incredible uh, stills of uh, Ian as a football From hero. From early before? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Did you like me? Making movies? I love making movies. I love producing movies. I still do it. I, the year before last, I did one uh, of my book, Hollywood Wives, The New Generation, which starred Farrah Fawcett and Robin Givens and Melissa Gilbert and uh, Jack Scalia. And you that help? was really fun. Do you help with the casting? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Well, you talked about your lucky character, and that was made into a miniseries. What, six hours or something like that? I wrote 10 hours of prime time for NBC. And Lucky was portrayed by Nicolette Sheridan, who's now found great fame on Desperate House. Wives. <laughs> and uh, her mother in the movie, because her mother is killed when she is five, was played by Sandra Bullock. Oh my God. And once again, if people go to the website, JackieCollins.com, they can look up the stills from Lucky Chances and see Sandra and see Nicolette as Lucky. And that's really fun for people to do. They like doing that. Usually, when someone's book is made into a movie yeah. or made into a TV series, someone else comes in and writes the screenplay. But you do that all yourself? I used to do it all myself. Oh. <laughs> I did it for, for Lady Boss and Lucky Chances. And then after that, I thought, well, I'll let somebody else write the script for um, Hollywood Wives, The New Generation. But I executive produced it. You are a Hollywood wife. And you had to walk a fine line with your friends. Did any of them ever see themselves in your characters? Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. They would uh, sidle up to me and say, is that me? What is that me? It can't possibly be me. I mean, people love to play the guessing game in this town, as you know. Right. And but, they love success. But so do they want to be that character? They want, you know, <laughs> I'm a big auction item now. Right. A mention in a Jackie Collins book can raise thousands of dollars for a charity. That's which what's is so wonderful. Yeah. That's wonderful. You know, some authors have been uh, ostracized from their social groups because of what they've written and well, how they've Well, if I done. did a Truman Capote, not that I'm as talented as a Truman Capote because that man was a genius, but he actually... <clears throat> You know, he, he blotted his copybook by writing about all his friends in the most intimate way. Well, you know and I know that I have friends in this town that are all powerful. And 
maybe we see them in a different light than the general public, but if I wanted to write them warts and all, I could do it, but yeah, I wouldn't. Yeah, but you wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do I mean, that. I've seen you in jewelry stores at Gucci, up and down Rodeo yeah. Drive, I mean, on Madison Avenue, and um, you buy the same designer clothes and jewelry that all your friends I keep, do. I keep secrets. <laughs> you you know, do? I keep secrets that's, very well. That's uh, where you get your stories from those shops? Of course, but I also have a sense of humor about the whole thing and a sense of the ridiculous. And so I try to portray people so they won't quite recognize themselves, but maybe they'll recognize their best friend, even though it's them. <laughs> when I first talked to you about writing years ago, you used to write on a legal pad. With I still pen. do, Joan. <gasps> you do? I still do. I've got the computer and I love emails and I love, you know, printing off my photos and going to iTunes and making my own CDs. But as far as writing is concerned, it's that felt pen and the legal pad and that's the way I write. I couldn't believe that. I thought for sure <laughs> after all these years you would no, have changed. No, I love it. And it's kind of like, you know, it's, to me that's writing. And when do, when do you write? Talking about oh, writing. Oh, God. <laughs> All the time, all the time. I was just in Acapulco with the Canes and the Brickuses, and we had a wonderful time. And Michael was by the pool writing his second autobiography, and I was by the pool writing the new Lucky book, which is Drop Dead Beautiful, The Continuing Adventures of Lucky Santangelo. That Lucky Santangelo has she just She gets been, around she five is books. quite a character, five isn't books. she? This is going to be the sixth book about her. Do you remember all the titles of all your books? Oh, yeah, absolutely. You do? Oh, yeah. <laughs> because I think one time Good I titles. talked to Dan, Daniel Steele, and she couldn't remember all the Well, titles. that's because Daniel has got like 865 oh. books. I mean, <laughs> Daniel is an amazing woman. She writes, she's always three books ahead. Oh, right. But her books are, are, are quite short. Mine when, are you, quite long. when you did Lovers and Players, as you say, yes. it's just a short period in New York. Seven days. But you, did you travel to locations? Because they're coming and going. Oh, I did, yeah. I was actually writing it when we had those terrible floods here and the rain. Oh, and very so dark. Chris, who had the house in L.A., he had this pristine house up on Benedict Canyon. Uh, while I was writing this book, his house got slimed. It slid down the hill. Oh. Because this is what was actually going on around me. And I, I wanted to incorporate that in the book, and it became a very good dramatic kind of point for the book, that there's this, you know, top Hollywood agent, who, a lawyer, who's got all these very important clients, and yet his house is getting destroyed while he has to sit in New York waiting for his father, who has summoned all three sons to New York to, do, they don't know what. Don't is know. he going to die? What's going to happen here? We don't know why. And they really, you know, they really <laughs> want him to say to them, I'm sorry I treated you so badly. Right. They want the money, but that's not the main thrust. Right. They want him to accept them. Because it's a, it's a story of human beings, yes. which you always capture. You capture the human beings and you tell the the um, pathos in them. That's what I wanted to do with Lovers and Players. I very much wanted to tell a story of a family. A dysfunctional family, yes, but a family. Because I know so many people who have come from that kind of a background. When you talk about Chris going to Hollywood and his house sliding down yes. the hill, do you think about him when you're writing, that he's a friend for these however long it takes you to oh, write? Oh, yeah. I, I, Do you talk I, to him? I, I, I completely feel whatever he feels, you know. Uh, I, I become the character when I'm writing that character. That's what I And wonder. they become me and they take me on a trip. And I don't know what they're going to do next. I don't plan my books. I don't say, oh, it's going to be seven days in New York and that this is going to happen and that is going to happen. And I'm told all the time, I couldn't put your book down. And I think it's because I couldn't put my pen down when I was writing it. Is that right? Yeah. That's how you think. Um, when, you're, when you're thinking about these characters yeah. and they're alive to you, do you um, take the time to connect them. I mean, are you like this triple personality, I think is what I'm trying to ask. I think Because you have so many people. Yeah, you know, it's all in my head. They're all in my head and they all have their own separate places in right. my head. So when I'm writing Liberty, I'm thinking only of Liberty and oh. maybe her mother, Diane, oh, who's the housekeeper to Red Diamond. It's kind of, I do write kind of intricate books, but it's all in my head. There's no plan of what's going to happen next. Are you doing like one chapter and then going on to another chapter, or do you just write continuously? I write continuously. You do? So yes. So the story just yes. unfolds? So it never becomes boring for me, because um. the story unfolds. And so I'll just get fed up with writing about one character, and then I'll go to another character. Um. And then by that time, I'll be ready to get back to the other character. Do you edit yourself along the way, or do I you do. Wait? 
I, I'm a big editor of myself. So by the time I deliver the book, it's what you see, it's what you get. I mean, I, I don't want to be edited. I mean, you know, my editor might say to me, can you soften that line there or something like that, but I'm very minor editor because I've done so much myself by the time the book is finished. And then um, as you edit, it goes to New York or wherever, and do they do very much more editing? Or no, no, do you well, stop? I, I, I never show them anything until I'm finished a book. Oh, so they just get it yes, finished? Yes, they get a finished manuscript. And then do they say, oh, it's too many pages, or can you help us? No, nobody's us? ever said that to me. <laughs> no? I'm going to say no, no, I've never. I've, I've heard writers who've said, oh, you know, my editor said to me, put in some sex scenes. And I, I right. how can you put in sex scenes? The or sex cut in it, my or books. Or cut them out. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, people say to me, oh, the sex is very sexy in your books because it comes in naturally just like it does in life. If people are going to have sex, it just is there, you know. I don't think, oh, my characters are going to have sex today. Ooh, let's put on some good music. No. They, they just, it, it happens. They just do. Yeah. What about lovers and players? How long did it take to write it? it took me about nine months. It's like having a baby. Yeah, just what I said. Because I write, books. yes, birthing <laughs> books, because I write in longhand. Well, let's see, you know, I've been writing for uh, 30 years, so I've got 24 books. I need to get six books out there quickly. Which was the longest? Take Chances. To it took you the longest Chances, to write? yeah. And why was it? Why did you struggle with it? I didn't struggle with it, but it's such a saga. I mean, if nobody's ever read me before, they should read Chances. Of course, There's they read so Lovers and Players right, first. Right, right. Yeah, because <laughs> I, I always call Chances my early Harold Robbins, and it takes place over 50 years, so there's so much research. And I was cutting back and forth between my black character, Carrie, who, who started off as a, a, a sort of a girl on the streets, and she became a great society lady in New York, and Gino. So it was Gino's story and Carrie's story, a black family and a white oh, right. Italian family. Right, right. Well, we talked about your producing TV series yeah. and producing films. Have, have you ever thought of producing someone else's work? You know, I've never thought of that. I never have the time to do that. I'd like to. I, I think would it would be interesting, yes. What about directing? And I also think I would like to do that, too. But, you know, who has the time? No, I was just going to say, before we leave, what do you do in your spare time? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, somebody's about to take an option on Lovers and Players, so I will executive produce that. Oh, so we have yeah. a film coming up. We have a film coming up. Oh. And then also I'm creating with Jonathan Prince a, a two-part uh, novella for TV. So we'll see oh. if that goes through or not. Because as everybody knows who works in Hollywood, until you sign on the dotted line, right. nothing is definite. Until you see that green light flashing in your eye, nothing is definite. But those are the two things I'm working on. Thanks, Jackie. Thank you, Joan. It was such a pleasure. Thank you. Great to see you again. Give my love to the kids. Thanks. <laughs>
Um, it didn't occur to you to be an English major in any way? It didn't occur to me to be an English major? I mean, oh, not an English major, uh -huh. a music I mean, major. No, I mean... <laughs> you I, were an English major. I was an English major. No, it didn't occur to me. I, I, it was something, it was like a deep dream of mine, but uh -huh. I'm like, oh, you can't do it, you'll never do it. And then one day I just realized I had to go for it, and it sort of evolved naturally. Did the English, back to English, I think it's on my mind, help you in writing your songs? Because you do write a lot of your songs. I do write all my songs. Uh, the English, I, I really wouldn't say help me. <laughs> so you come from a Armenian family, which is usually close-knit, I think. Yeah. Did they object to this uh, career? Because you can have, as you said in your uh, little thing, that, bio, you could have gone both ways. You could have been an Armenian housewife or you could have been an Armenian career person. <laughs> right. Well, I think that they're nervous because it's, it's a tough, tough thing to try to strive to achieve, but they've always been supportive. <laughs> I think they wish I had done something a little more uh, Normal. <laughs> <laughs> Which is what? <laughs> Which is, I don't know, you know, like be a doctor or a lawyer or some kind of, you know, traditional career that's respectable. Although art is great, it's just a difficult road. Explain the music, how it came about, and you talk about doing it on um, computer. Uh, tell us a little bit what, about what it is and how you describe it. Well, the music is basically my expression of how I decided to follow my path in life and focus on my heart's desire as opposed to what you know my mind was telling me would be good to do or what society's influences were including my family right. and the whole album is about the struggles of following your path and sticking to it uh -huh. and how fears creep in and deter you and make you afraid and how you just gotta fight through and get to where you need to go. What did you call it? The, the name of the record, it's called The Good Looking Revolution. So you were looking at revolution in many ways. What were the inspirations for writing these? I, I hear a lot of drum beats. Everything is really beat driven. I'm That's really it. into I'm really into the beats and it just sort of, it just evolved, it came out of me. I can't really say that I thought about it. It just, the music was just a natural thing. I hear an ethnic mix a little bit. Would that have been a, any kind of influence? Well, I mean, clearly. I mean, my, my background has always been a huge part of, of who I am. And uh, I really love a lot of the sounds that I find in certain ethnic musics. And I just wanted to translate it in a modern way. That's I, I hear a lot of that. Um, I think when you were making this album, which you produced. I co-produced. Oh, you co-produced? Yeah. Um, people were telling you, do this, do that, do this, do that, and did you follow those commercial mores that they were asking you to do or no. telling you to do? No, I really stuck to my guns and made sure that it was truthful according to what I wanted to say. Because I feel that good art is art that's true as opposed to art that's copied or, you know, when, well, you, when you listen to others, you don't ever really say what you want to say. So, actually when you're composing this music, you use a computer, you don't use a piano, you don't have any? Well, I mean, I have a MIDI keyboard. Oh, you do have so a keyboard. So it's a key piano keyboard <laughs> that triggers uh, programs in the computer. Pro Tools and Reason are the ones that I use. So then how do you do it? What do you start? How do you start doing something? Because you use it, you said you're going to use it to perform on stage. Mm -hmm. You need your computer. I mean, are you dancing with the computer? Are you holding it? What no, do you I do? I mean, the, the computer will sit there and run the tracks. And, uh, and I where will, are you? I'll be apart from the computer dancing and singing. And did you take uh, classical dance? No, I don't have classical training, but it's in my blood, so. <laughs> <laughs> so is it just a modern kind of dance while you're singing, or is it just background? It's, well, it's, it's a little bit of both, a little bit while I'm singing, while I'm not singing, when there's just musical parts in the song. And it's a little bit of uh, my ethnic roots with modern dancing. Well, with your ethnic roots, do you speak Armenian? Yes. Oh, you do? Mm -hmm. do you, that's a cool thing, though, to yeah. use the language and those kind of things. I actually, I have a song where I, uh, there's a backing vocal that is, is actually an Armenian prayer and, lyric. And do you say it? Yeah. And, how, and do you know, say it's what it Surpas is? Surpasvats, uh. which is Dear God. And is that just over and over in the um, background? No, it's just, it's, a, it's in a particular part in the song. It's the background to the breakdown of the song. 
Oh, that's great. Have yeah. you written with other people? No, this, this, I wrote alone and I did this all myself. In the future, it'd be great to collaborate, but I really wanted to, what I needed to say in this record, I needed to do on my own. So. That's what I wondered if you worked with someone else. And also, have you ever thought of putting together a band? I think eventually. I think right now I'm, I'm interested in doing a one-woman piece because it, it seems fitting to the music and the content. But uh, on the record, I had a, a, a viola player, Miguel Atwood Ferguson. He came and played one of my oh. um, melodies, and it was so amazing having like just such a brilliant musician come and play. Um, and eventually, I'd like to, to take it to that level. It's just sort of not happening right that, now. That also is a different kind of a mood. Yes. The, 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 um, well, they bring, their, own, they bring yeah. their passion into it. So you, you have an artist who is taking what you've written and bringing their thing to it, which is always amazing. And then I have a producer named Yonatan who, who really was my partner in crime on this and helped guide me and get me to where I needed to get to as an artist. So, so the next step, where do we see Avakian going? Well, Avakian will be playing <laughs> soon. She'll be playing her show. And um, I'll be starting in LA and hopefully going on the road. And um, So you have a whole little schedule. Oh, yeah. So we can look for you where? Around California? Around California first, and then hopefully worldwide. Okay. I'm hoping to go <laughs> everywhere. So. No, I love the idea that you were using the lyrics with a foreign language, because we have so many other artists who use the foreign languages, and you don't really have to understand it. You can just feel it from the music. Right. Well. This, partic this particular piece that I did use was, uh, it's just a really moving uh, gesture in the Armenian church. And the song is sort of anti-establishment, anti-cultural, oh. like ropes and ties. And so, so it's I, the mix? It is. The pull? Yeah, and you can hear, you can hear the struggle in my voice. It's a very... The, the you know the the Armenian culture has been one that struggled with a lot of things. So, so say goodbye to us in Armenian. Um, <laughs> oh my God, I'm blanking. I'm blanking. That's okay. <laughs> how how does it go? Stay tuned. Okay. Goodbye. Bye bye. <laughs> and thanks for watching, Natalie Avakian. Keep writing to seven 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 South Figueroa, forty fourth floor, Los Angeles nine zero zero one seven. See you next time on the Joan Quinn Profiles. Thank you.